We'll hold. We'll see if it's something in. We'll hold 30 seconds. Test. Hi, everybody. OK, we're going to start in about 30 seconds. So come on in, find some seats. We've got some seats up from here. Come on in. OK, let's kick start up. I am very excited to announce that Alexander Ulanov from Hewlett Packard Labs is going to be presenting a joint, uh, his joint work with a scalable implementation of deep learning on Spark. So let's give a huge round of applause for Alexander. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexander. And I'm going to talk about a scalable implementation of deep learning on Spark. So this is a joint work with Chiang Guru Meng from Databricks and Bert Grevenbosch from Huawei. Also with the help from Guachan Li from Spark Community and Andrei Simonovsky from Hewlett Packard Labs. Four of us didn't know each other until we met on the Spark developers mailing list. And Spark served us as a common platform uh, in which we can collaborate together, the people with from different companies and with different background, and everyone benefits from this. Uh, the outline of my talk is as follows. I'm going to talk briefly about the artificial neural networks and about the implementation of multi-layer perceptron in Spark. I'm going to go into details about the optimizations that we have applied, and we'll conclude with experiments and future work. The optimizations and the heuristic for parallelization that we have used might be also interesting for other people who implement different algorithms for Spark. So what is neural networks? So I'm going to talk a little about it. It's a statistical model that approximates a function of multiple inputs. It consists of interconnected neurons and they exchange messages. Neuron produces an output by applying a transformation function on it on its inputs. And neurons are usually grouped into layers. Network with more than three layers of neurons is usually called deep. And it can be considered as an instance of deep learning. So for example, on the right hand side, you can see a simple neural network with two inputs, one output, and one hidden layer with three neurons. Uh, there can be different types of, new, uh, of layers. and the type of the layer is defined by the transformation function. For example, a thin transformation when you multiply the inputs with some weights and add a bias, or sigmoid transformation when you map the inputs into the interval 0, 1, which is quite useful for a classification, for example. Also, there are other layers like convolutional or softmax, etc. And multilayer perceptron is a network with several pairs of affine and sigmoid layers. Model parameters are the weights that neurons use for transformations. And those parameters are iteratively estimated with the backpropagation algorithm. Multilayer perceptron is widely used for speech recognition nowadays, in particular for phoneme classification. And it, it is also used in computer vision as a top layer for convolutional networks. And it is introduced in Spark 1.5. Let me give you an example of multilayer perceptron in Spark. Uh, assume we want to create a handwritten digit recognition a classifier from grayscale images. So they are of size 28 by 28 pixels. And there are total uh, 10 different digits. So the multilayer perceptron will have 784 inputs and 10 outputs. So the, it, the input size is the number of pixels, and the output size is the number of different digits. 
we also add two hidden layers of 300 and 100 neurons, which uh, provide better accuracy according to the reference paper. On the slide, you can see the Scala code and Python code for creating this classifier. In the first line, we load the data set. In the second line, we create a multi-layer perceptron and specify the layers that it should use. And the last line is actual training. After that, we can use this classifier for prediction. Also, if you want to do other transformations before or after the classifier, you can use multi-layer perceptron in Spark pipelines. Uh, on this screen, uh, there are examples for Scala and Python code for doing this. Also, in the first line, we open the data set. In the second line, we apply PCA transformation and extract 20 features. After that, we use multi-layer perceptron classifier to train using those features. And this is rather simple. So now let me talk about the actual implementation itself. We addressed three main requirements. Conform to Spark APIs, extensible interface, and efficiency and scalability. So why do we need to conform to Spark API? Because Spark basically can run any Java, Scala, or Python library, not necessarily designed for Spark. So there is a problem that it will result in expensive data movement from the library to Spark RDD. And also, it will prohibit us from using Spark machine learning pi pipelines. So we address this requirement. Uh, second requirement is extensible interface. And our implementation processes each layer as a black box with backpropagation in general form. So that allows a rather simple introduction of new layers and features. The developer has to implement rather simple interface in order to add new layer, for example. And currently, there are several features under development by the community, uh, like convolutional networks, autoencoder, restricted Boltzmann machines, and others. So let me talk in more details about the third requirements, which is efficiency and scalability. Efficiency is addressed with batch processing. As I mentioned before, multi-layer perceptron uh, consists of several pairs of affin and sigmoid transformations. And layers affin transformation can be represented in vector form, like this y equals to w transpose time x plus b, where y is the output from the layer, and it is of size, and w is the matrix of layer weights, B is bias, it's vector of size n. There is a mistake on the slide. X is the input to the, to the layer. And you can also see this transformation on the right-hand side as a picture. So it's pretty simple. But uh, those kind of uh, vector matrix multiplications are not very efficient, so we want to use matrix matrix multiplications. Uh, then we need to stack input vectors into batches so we will be able to do matrices multiplication. Then uh, capital X becomes the matrix of inputs, capital Y becomes the matrix of outputs, and B should also become a matrix so that it would work and it will contain copies of B, of small b. So you can see also this transformation on the right-hand side. So basically we just uh, did batch processing. We implemented it and it enabled use of uh, native BLAST libraries. And also, we did some optimizations for uh, reducing the garbage collection overhead. So what is BLAST? Um, BLAST is basic linear algebra subprograms. It is provided in the hardware-optimized libraries in C and Fortran. Uh, for CPU, there are quite a few of such libraries, for example, Intel MKL or OpenBLAS. And for GPU, there is NVBLAS, and it is basically a Fortran interface to CUDA BLAS. Those libraries can be used in Spark through the Netlib Java interface, but you need to build Spark with specific parameter, which will include native binaries into Spark assembly. In order to measure the uh, 
uh, the benefit that we can get from BLAS. We measured the time needed for matrices multiplication, depending on the matrices sizes and libraries that we used. Uh, lower is better. So for example, uh, native BLAS uh, gives huge be benefit comparing to pure Java implementation, which is a gray line, F2J BLAS. And also GPU uh, also provides us some performance improvement, but only for large matrices. It is the blue line. Uh, it happens only when, we, when the compute is larger than the transfer from to GPU memory. And it really happens only for very large matrices. You can see more details about this benchmark on uh, using this link and also in our recent paper. So indeed, using native BLAS in Spark uh, can provide a benefit. So now let me talk about the third requirement, which is uh, scalability. Uh, as I mentioned before, the parameters of the model are est estimated with the backpropagation algorithm. And the routine for optimization is gradient descent. On each iteration, we compute a gradient and then update the parameters accordingly. In Spark, there is the default parallelism, which is data parallelism. So let's see how it will look like with data parallelism. On each iteration, uh, all the executors receive the weights from master. Then each executor computes the gradient based on its local data. After that, the gradients are sent back to master, and master computes the new vector of parameters based on the gradients. And this process repeats until uh, it, it is converged. Though there are different types of gradients. Uh, first is batch gradient, when you process all data on each iteration. There is stochastic gradient, when you process a random, random point on each iteration. And there is a mini batch gradient, when you process random batches on each iteration. And I'm going to talk about the batch gradient. So it seems that it's possible to do parallelization with data in Spark. Uh, but how many workers to use? It seems obvious that if we use less workers, then we have less compute power. Uh, but if we add more workers, then there is a communication overhead, because everyone needs to communicate the gradients and the parameters. So let's look at this in more details. Uh, assume that uh, in our data set there are deep data points, and each point has f features, and there are k classes. And for s simplicity, let's assume, you assume that we want to train a logistic regression classifier. It has f times k parameters. So what would be the communication for this case? Uh, there are n workers, and they get and send fk 64-bit parameters through the network. Network has bandwidth B and software overhead C for sending or receiving the message. And we can get the following formula. Let me explain it in more details. Uh, the first, uh, at first two, we get from the fact that there are uh, communications in both ways. In first place, master sends the parameters to all the workers, and the second place, workers send gradients to the master. So there are two communications. 64 times fk divided by b is just the time needed to transfer one vector of parameters for one worker. C is our constant for software overhead. And the logarithm means that we are doing all reduced style communication. So we are doing it at several layers, which is better than doing than sending one to everyone. With regards to computation, each worker has a particular amount of flops, and it processes d divided by n data, assuming that data is equally uh, distributed among workers. And it needs fk operations. And the computation time will be d fk divided by np. 
So now we have computation and communication, and we can try to find the optimal solution for this, uh, minimized by the number of workers. And we can get the for following formula. Uh, this formula can be generalized if we substitute fk for w, which is the number of model parameters, and at the same time, the number of floating point operations that we need to compute this parameter. Let's analyze this formula and see if it makes sense. Uh, so for example, if we have a lot of flops and we compute very fast, uh, then this means a lower degree of parallelism because we will head, hit the communication overhead very quickly. At the same time, if our computation is complex, so we have many more features and more classes, or this is a deep network with a lot of weights, then we spend a lot of time in compute. And this time might be similar to the communication time, and that means higher degree of parallelism. Also, the small overhead means also high degree of parallelism, just because C is in the denominator. So we also need fast software for sending receiving messages. So let's try to compute something with this formula. Assume we have a data set of 8 million data points with 784 features, 10 classes, and we train logistic regression classifier. Our CPU is 32 gigaflops on each node, and we have one gigabit network. And there is an overhead of 0.1 second. After putting those parameters into the formula, we get six workers. I think this is good, so that means that we can parallelize our training and we can benefit from this, and we can benefit from using cluster. So let's switch to the actual testing of multilayer perceptron. We, we have used the MNIST uh, optical character recognition data set with 60K samples and a large neural network with six layers uh, that contain 12 million of parameters. As a baseline, we have used a deep learning tool from Berkeley called CAFE, which is single node implementation, and it can run both on GPU and CPU. And for Spark, we have used only CPU nodes and up to five workers. So we're measuring the time needed for one iteration on this data set with those parameters. Uh, lower is better. Uh, you can see on this uh, figure that for a single node, our implementation is slower than CAFE with CPU. And I, I think this is okay because Scala might have some overhead comparing to C++. And 1.6 slower is rather a good result. Uh, but if we are talking about scalability, we get pretty nice speed up. For five nodes, we get 4.7x speed up, which uh, beats CAFE on CPU and becomes closer to GPU. And GPU is the gray line. On the other hand, we uh, see the increasing communication cost. So that it seems that it does not worth using more workers. But indeed, four or fi five workers will be very nice to use in this task. And if we use our uh, heuristic, it suggests four workers, which is pretty close to what we get empirically. Uh, conclusions. Uh, there is a scalable multilayer perceptron available in Spark 1.5 and it provides extensible internal API for artificial neural networks. And the further contributions are very welcome, and they are quite easy to make. We also have shown that native BLAS and GPU speeds up Spark for certain tasks and provide nice heuristics for parallelization of batch gradient. We also have some work in progress related to deep learning uh, developed by different people from community. Uh, in particular, it is autoencoder, restricted Boltzmann machines, dropout, and convolutional neural network. And you can trace the progress of those features in Spark 5575 
umbrella feature in Jira. Future work is related to stochastic gradient descent and parameter server, which probably can speed up the computations. I also would like to invite you to the HP Discover event, which happens in London in the first week of December. We are going to talk about the machine, which is the new uh, shared memory computing architecture. And one of our demonstrations will be based on Spark. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks very much. Uh, let's go right to questions. We will have about 10 minutes or so to do, OK? Uh, you start raised first, I'll go with you, and then I'll go to you. Hi. Uh, regarding the scalability, um, what, how the scalabil what is the scalability in uh, function of the number of layers in the, your topology when you build the, you know, the neural network? Is this going to impact in the final scalability of the algorithm? Uh, yes, so the question is, uh, what is the function of scalability with regards to the number of layers? Uh, so uh, the type of parallelization that we implemented, it is data parallelization. So we just divide the data into chunks, and each node pr processes, processes its chunk. So we are not implementing the parallelization on the level of layers, of individual layers. So there will be no function. Uh, but at the same time, as I mentioned, if there are a lot of layers and there are a lot of weights, then uh, there are better parallelization possibilities because you can spend a lot of time computing and uh, communication overhead will be smaller. And on, on the other hand, if there are only few layers and it's very simple, then there are less parallelization capabilities because you will hit hit the communication overhead. So it would make sense to get the whole network and then create sub-networks and then do some uh, parallel algorithm by, you know, in the different sub-networks instead of uh, training within the whole, you know, the complete network and by downsampling, by, you know, you're doing an ensembling essentially like bootstrapping and then you ensemble the results of the different models. So do, have you ever thought about different uh, way for improving the, the way you are partitioning and the way you're parallelizing your algorithm? Uh, so we have not yet uh, touched this, though there are several options. Uh, so for example, you can train different models at the same time, and then pick the, the one that provides better performance in terms of accuracy. You can use uh, regularization techniques like uh, dropout or uh, L1, L2 regularization. Uh, with regards to the parallelization of the network itself, uh, there are some clever tricks, and they are very specific to the application. Like, there are clever tricks for speech recognition or for convolutional networks. And we have not yet touched this. Hi, um, just a quick um, question, really. Um, so the multi-layer perceptron, that, can I find that in the MLlib library? Is that right? Yes. That's all I wanted to find in out. In 1.5. Yeah, OK, thanks. Hi there. You mentioned Dropout. Does the um, uh, does the library that's there support Dropout? Can you tune it at the different layers? Uh, no, it uh, the one that is in Spark release uh, it doesn't support Dropout, but there is a uh, pull request for this. It is not merged yet. So um, hello. Uh, can you go back, please, to the scalability results? Oh, sure. Yeah, maybe there's something I missed, but um, the results with MLP are without BLAST native library, or with? Uh, so for scalability, I don't, I don't have here the results without native BLAST, sure. uh, and basically that would not make a lot of sense because you always have a CPU, 
<laughs> so you can use native blast. Okay. So, so these results are with uh, GP GPU, right? No. The, uh, the results for multi-layer percep perceptron on this slide are for CPU native oh. blast. Okay. And there is one result for GPU, which is the gray line, and it refers to cafe. Mm -hmm. The cafe with GPU. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, there was a. Uh, I was wondering if you could an optimizer that converges faster, like BFGS. Did you try that? Uh, actually, the default optimizer is LBFGS. So if you if you use a multi-layer perceptron, uh, it will it will use LBFGS optimizer. So did you try a Spark with a GPU? Yes, I have tried it. Uh, and let me go back to the slide with, uh, with the matrices multiplication benchmark. So I can comment. Yeah, so the blue line here stands for GPU. And this is only matrices multiplication. Uh, if you go to the uh, backpropagation for neural network, then you have multiple matrices and ve vector multiplication. And in this case, each of the operation involves data movement to GPU and from GPU. And for, for most, of the, most of the time, uh, it would not provide a big advantage over the native blast with CP CPU uh, because you just do that of movement. But for matrices multiplication themselves, it can be beneficial. So, uh, and also I would like, like to say that you don't usually own a cluster with GPUs, so that, that's not very practical. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Or? No. Okay. Uh, for uh, for GPUs, there is uh, one more uh, library called uh, Spark CL. They use um, they allow you to write uh, Java-based uh, GPU kernels, and then you can maybe that will be more beneficial than just using the blast. Uh, yeah, I am aware of this library. Uh, it is it is a Spark based library. Sp yeah. Spark CL. Yeah, I, I'm aware about this. Uh, so our our goal was that uh, everyone could use uh, this um, development, and to use it, you don't need to do any particular thing. So you don't you do not need to download separate packages or something else. So you just need to download Spark. Uh, but uh, certainly the, there are ways how to improve uh, the GPU part, how to, uh, how to make everything in GPU and do not do data transfer. But it would be a separate implementation. Cool. Uh, we've got time for one more question. So any more? Okay. See you here. Um, hi. Um, I, maybe I've j uh, misunderstood your, uh, your analysis or misinterpreted it. Um, my question is, will, uh, will a Spark implementation, as you've described it here, will that ever beat a single GPU uh, training algorithm? Because, uh, I mean, the line was completely flat in a number of processes when you showed the GPU accelerated uh, uh, line okay. perception. Let, let me go to this. So basically, this completely flat line, it refers to the deep learning tool CAFE, which, which has single node implementation. OK. So the answer to my question is, I mean, is that blue line ever going ever gonna to touch the gray line? The, the gray line? It doesn't look like it, does it? Yeah, so, so in this case, it seems that it, it's not going to touch this line. So uh, but 
for some other uh, setup, it might touch it. And uh, the thing is that you, you might have a cluster, but you might not have a GPU. So you can just run it on a cluster and get almost the same performance as if you have bought a uh, separate machine with GPU and installed everything and made everything work. Okay. Uh, well, that's it for today. Uh, again, we wanted to thank uh, Alexander for this awesome presentation.